Francesco Goya. The frontispiece shows in its central part the most important of Goya at its full maturity, the Machas on the Balcony. Here, the version of the Metropolitan Museum of New York. The whole picture shows those subtle shades of blue that appear in the white of the garment of the Macha on the left. It's the work we will focus on this evening, but first we will present unextensively most of Goya's career in order to put this particular painting in perspective. We'll have to remember this picture when we will see the version that, much later, Manet did of the same subject, the balcony. We will see the enormous influence Spanish painting had on Manet, and therefore over the beginnings of what later will be called French Impressionism. The story of the painting. It's a large painting, a Goya of utmost importance, 1 meter 94 high and 1 meter 25 wide. We know that Goya did paint it somewhere between 1809 and 1811, and that Goya was 64 or 66. This makes him a mature man. We also particularly know that he has been deaf for several years, having totally lost his hearing. Furthermore, his general health is not good at all. We know almost all the dates, places, even hours of his appointments with his two regular physicians in Madrid, but there is not a word about a diagnosis for his mysterious bad condition. The only thing we know is that these years have been very bad years for him indeed. These are also very bad years for Spain, going through times of uncertainty in the aftermath of its invasion by France. King Charles IV, having abdicated, he did try to put his son, Ferdinand VII, Prince of Asturias, on the throne. Then, Ferdinand VII abdicated. At that time, France is ruling Spain with Joseph Bonaparte as king, reigning in Madrid in the name of his brother Napoleon. That's when the Spanish nationalist reaction, a passionate, violent and dramatic movement, gets organized. We are just after the massive horrors of the war's disasters, but the memory is still there. Extortions and injustice are going on. This picture, with a sunray on the two young women, gets a totally different meaning, as behind the two young women, so much in the light, so fragile by this light, these are two shadows of machos, opaque and worrying, giving this group a dramatic, clair-obscure and a bit of Caravagesque aspect. There are two very similar autographed versions of this picture. The first version is the one upon whom all art historians agree to be the first attempt. The work is in Geneva, and notwithstanding that the owners keep on writing private collection whenever it is published, everybody knows that it belongs to the Rothschilds. In any case, since it had been exhibited in Martigny in 1982. Every Swiss is aware that in Geneva, within the admirable Rothschild collection, there is one of the most beautiful Goyas, the first version of the Machas, a little bit smaller as it measures only 1 meter 62. It was Rothschild's version which was the first one to be examined in the laboratories, and this turned out to be very important, as they found a mark on the left-hand corner of the painting, and recovered, more or less wittingly, a mysterious X-24, that at first amazed the art historians, but could be explained. X is the initial of Xavier, the French spelling of Javier, Goya's son. It's number 24 of the paintings Javier Goya inherited at his father's death, or at least it's the number 24 of the paintings his son took, quite dishonestly, at his father's demise. This painting was part of Javier Goya's collection, 
and in 1826, Javier sold it to Baron Taylor, French agent on account of the French king Louis Philippe, sent to Spain to find beautiful pieces of painting in order to give some prestige to the Spanish gallery of the Louvre, who already had a Velázquez, a Murillo, and a rather bad Ribera. This collection should be uplifted. Baron Taylor, who had quite large means at his disposal, masterly chose the most beautiful Velázquezes, the most beautiful Riberas, and, above all, the most beautiful Goyas, which were for sale at the time. The two Mahas became part of the Louvre collection under Louis-Philippe. When Louis-Philippe had to abdicate, his collection of paintings was considered by France as being personal rather than national property. He went away with all his paintings, went to London, and our painting was put up for sale at Christie's, where it was sold for £70 sterling. There were two more owners until it ended up in the actual collection, where it still remains and has never left, but once, for the 1982 exhibition in Martigny. The second version in the Metropolitan Museum of Art comes from a very big American collection, the Adenmeyer Collection. It was made a bequest to the Met in 1929. The art historians now had the opportunity to see the two versions side by side on the occasion of this New York exhibition, and they still fight to the day to establish which is the better one. It is true that the Geneva one is more inventive. One senses a Goya much freer, hence the idea, this must be the first one. But the painting is maybe not so good in the details. There is a softness in the New York version that isn't there in the Geneva's. There is an agreement now to recognize the Geneva one as the first, but a relatively quickly executed one. And that in view, that of this first successful version, a second version, the one in New York, was immediately executed by Goya, but with much more care. Voila. That's what there had to be said about this painting. It's two versions and the situation in the years 1809 to 1811. A little bit of history. France and Europe between 1809 and 1811 is living under the sign of Napoleon I's empire. All that is happening in the world is happening in one and only place, Paris, France. Napoleon is not going through his best years. He has just left Josephine and is preparing to marry Mary Louise. His wedding will take place on April 2nd, 1810. The King of Rome, dynastic heir, will be born shortly afterwards on March 20th, 1811. The First Empire's period is well known enough, but as we are going to talk about history of culture and arts, we will have to mention some dates of that time. While Goya was painting the Majas on the balcony, Beethoven, the other great deaf artist, composed Egmont. 1810 is also the blossoming year for the Romantic movement, and this is the birth year of Frédéric Chopin, Robert Schumann and Alfred de Musset. Three personalities were going to mark the great generation of the Romantic movement from 1830 to 1835. So, just a little few facts yet that will help us to understand the very uncertain and versatile orientation of the empire in those years like 1810. Madame de Stahl has just written De l'Allemagne. She has entrusted the manuscript to her publisher. It has been set and proofread. The imperial police is noticed, the manuscript is seized, the proofs and the printing plates of De l'Allemagne are destroyed on Napoleon's order. Madame de Stal is exiled and it is in Coppet, where she will find the haven of her dreams, that she will spend her time illuminating Europe with her so fruitful thoughts. Also, in the literary scene of the 1810s, the great Heinrich von Kleist presents for the first time to the public his most famous play to be a masterpiece, The Prince of Hamburg. 
It will be Kleist's last as he commits suicide in the first days of the following year. On the field of painting, one lives in 1810 full neoclassicism. Everything that bears the signature of the empire, and therefore of Napoleon I, has to be inspired by Greece and Rome. The shadow of Winkelmann still sits enthroned. David is the only possible password. Ang is somehow the heir, but already appears as a deep divide in this neoclassical Europe. Two very young German painters, Overbeck and Faure, say clearly and loudly that they have enough of all these togas, all these cotroni, enough of all this doric, and that they want to emerge themselves again in a way of painting that is true, modest, simple, and they set off to Rome to create the movement of the Nazarenes, which too will become part of the Romantic movement. Caspar David Friedrich's genius is at its peak in these same years, 1810, when he signs the famous Cemetery Under the Snow. Again in the same year, but in a totally different domain, Dr. Heinemann establishes the doctrine of homeopathy with his first papers published in 1810. In order to get a somehow more methodical view of the subject, Jacques Edouard divided Goya's immense and great works into a number of specific chapters. Years of Formation. On March 30th, 1746, at Fuen de Todos, a small remote town of Aragon, a baby is born, Francisco, sixth child of José Goya, a gilder of very modest conditions, and of Ingracia Lucientes, the mother, of lesser Aragon nobility, a lost advantage as her parents entrusted her to a gilder with no future. For her, it was the convent or the master gilder. Good for us. A very modest childhood, bordering on poverty and distress, first studies at the Escuellas Pias of Zaragoza, and very quickly the decision to become a painter, which is approved by his father. He studies painting at the Academy of Zaragoza, where he becomes a pupil of José Luzán Martínez, quite a good genre painter in the tradition of pure Rococo, as it was fashionable in the years 1740-1760. He is trained in 1760, and he knows his business, knows how to prepare a canvas, putting it on stretchers, and he starts aiming for the great gates of paradise to enter the Royal Academy of San Fernando in Madrid, which is the school of schools. No one can become a painter in Spain without having studied there. With great diligence, he applies for the first time in 1763. He doesn't get a single vote. His name was not even mentioned. As the applications are every three years, he applies again in 1766, and again not one vote, and again no mentioning of his name. The big winner of the 1766 application is a promising painter, Ramon Bayeux, who will one day become Goya's brother-in-law. In that moment, he is a brilliant painter, light and easy, very much liked by the patrons of the Royal Academy. He is accepted unanimously. Goya returns to Zaragoza, renounces any official distinction, and looks for clients on his own. As he is young, without recommendations, unsponsored, totally unknown and not expensive, which is always a decisive argument, he builds up a small, very modest clientele. We know about his first work in 1762. He was commissioned to decorate a tabernacle of frescoes with drapes for the church hall of Fue de Todos, his birthplace, for ten reales. This first work of Goya was shown with fervor until 1936, when the tabernacle and the church were completely destroyed in the Civil War. After this first work, he moves away from his birthplace. 
It's around Zaragoza that he continues and will get numerous commissions regularly from religious communities. It's a bad time for Spanish religious congregations. Money is in short supply. The 17th century painters, who were all religious painters, had turned secular because of the desperate need of easy painter of Madrid's court. So if one finds a religious painter, inexpensive like Goya, one pounces on him. His first important commission has been preserved. It's for the Cartuja Audei near Zaragoza, a series of 11 paintings telling the Virgin's story. This is indeed Goya's first important documented work. We are going to have a detailed look at this first work and to a series of works related to Goya and religious painting, even much later works, as this is a domain of its own within his creative work. Religious painting. Visitation. This is his first work. Goya is still very young. The painting is now in an appalling state as it has been completely savaged by several restorations during the 19th century, completely washed out. But anyway, one can see it's not a work of genius. It has all the mannerism, spirit, oddly a bit of pontormo for the great draperies, quite skillful but showing nothing that what one day will be named Goya. Saint Bernard and Saint Robert. This work, one of three dealing with great saints, is a painting for the high altar in the church of Zaragoza. This is already a bit more Goya, but not quite, apart maybe for the extraordinary saint's face, where there is already an expressionism we will find again, but with so much passion, more formidable than in his last paintings. Christ on the Cross. The third religious painting is anything but what it should be. It's an extraordinary work, not for its quality, nor for its beauty, but for something totally different. One thinks of anything but Goya. Goya, too, didn't want to paint anything resembling to a Goya while doing it. We must keep in mind that we are now a few years after the events we have been talking about, and Goya still wishes to officialize a position in Madrid. So, in order to get into the Royal Academy, he signs this Christ on the cross in the manner of anything you want. There is a light a la Zurbaran, a tenderness a la Murillo, a pietism a la Velázquez. He signs this work, and great irony, it is with this work that he will unanimously be accepted at the Royal Academy. The Capture of Christ This is the first of Goya's genius religious works. We are at the beginning of his maturity, a piece of truly staggering power. He has very precise plans for it, as well as for its composition and for its destination. He is by now a respected and well-known painter. He can claim to paint for the Cathedral of Toledo, which is the pinnacle of the arts, as well as of music, architecture, sculpture and painting. It's for the sacristy of the Toledo Cathedral that he paints this Capture of Christ. He wants to be seen together with Greco's famous Spoliation of Christ. Still today, these two paintings remain in the sacristy, and it's extraordinary to see the accord, all in red of Greco's and all in yellow of Goya's work, and how the two canvases complete each other admirably. The cause of De la Florida. Still in his mature period, 18 months after the capture of Christ in Toledo, Goya is given a commission by the king for an oratory that has just been built, the oratory of San Antonio de la Florida in Madrid. It's a decoration with frescoes. It's nothing less than the dome, four pendentives, lunettes, vaults, 
and the apse of the high altar. Goya finishes all of it within 120 days. That's where one of the primary qualities of Goya's genius is so exciting, his formidable working speed and never ever show of any slightest flagging of inspiration. There are many painters who paint fast, but they don't paint very well, while Goya paints fast with his very own passion. That's the genius. One detail. Looking at the enlarged painting, one can see the brush strokes in white in yellow. These transparencies underneath the white are absolutely brilliant in this detail of the drummer in the cupola of the Florida. Jacques Edouard hasn't got any photo of the Florida to show us, as it has been closed for many years for restoration purposes. A signed study of the drummer of the Florida. This study is part of the Carnegie Collection in Pittsburgh, USA. It is the only signed study of the Florida drummer. Here are a few details so you can see what it is all about. People are leaning on a balustrade, as the two machas we have seen at the beginning will be doing years later, witnessing the miracle of Saint Anthony resurrecting a dead man so he can reveal the name of his murderer. Saint Anthony's father had been wrongly accused of a murder and his son could rehabilitate his father by divine intervention. It's simply a Madrilenian crowd, put into the miracle by Goya, a motley crowd. What is exceptional are the machas, machos, beggars, ugly old people in a picturesque climate, but also and above all, a sensuality of touch and colour that are mind-blowing. This boisterous group of people witnessing a miracle and at the same time attending holy office shows the originality of Goya's point of view. This Florida is the absolute masterpiece of his religious painting and a work, so we are told, soon to be reopened to the public and will deserve, on its own, a journey to Madrid. The Great Paintings Years Let's go back now to the end of Goya's youth years. An important event on July 25, 1773, is Goya's wedding. There is no need to say a lot about her, as Madame Goya never played any role in her husband's painting. Nevertheless, she is an exquisite woman and a good housekeeper, but that's about it. On the other hand, there is her family, that is of very great importance, as this woman is José Labayeux, the sister of the two most highly regarded painters at the time in Madrid. Ramon Bayeux, of whom we have already talked, and his brother, the better painter Francisco Bayeux. In order to give away their sister to the young Goya, they had to believe in Goya and his future. In fact, the two most highly regarded painters of Madrid launched the career of the young Goya. Madrid in those days was in dire need of painters. There had been two marvellous ones, but one died and the other left. The dead one is Tiepolo, he had just died. The other one, Raphael Mengs, who was considered a major painter at that time, had taken the first stagecoach to get to Rome, where juicier commissions were waiting for him. So Madrid finds herself without a painter. In a town poor in painters, even the inferior is of great importance. It was Ramon and Francisco Bayeux who pushed Goya by the back door into the world of painting. The king tried to relaunch the production of tapestry at Santa Barbara in order to breach the monopoly of French and Flemish tapestry production. A Spanish school and factory was needed, and it was Santa Barbara that developed very quickly to arrive at the level of the other great European factories. Cartons were needed. The great painters hated doing carton. It's a very tiny role to be a cartonist. 
The Bayous refused and pushed Goya into it, who started the adventures of his cartons. By contract, he had to produce cartons for 20 years from 1773 until 1793. His faith ties him with that of Santa Barbara. As a matter of fact, these cartons all have been preserved and are exhibited at the Prado. They belong to the masterpieces of the first maturity of Goya, and we're going to see a series of them. They will show us up to what point Goya stayed in the tradition of tapestry, with its amiable, bucolic, Arcadian side to it, that was so much a la mode in the 18th century, and how he had already detached himself from it. The Parasol this is the work that gives itself best to the tradition of the 18th century. It could be a carton of Boucher or of Fragonard, but it is so much better. It's in the spirit of Boucher and Fragonard. It became one of the biggest successes among Goya's light subjects. We find ourselves right in the years 1773 to 1775, he has already had a first productive series of commissions. The factory floor became adamant. How can you reproduce the green shadow transparency on the young woman's face with just wool? They were right. These cartons of Goya's are horribly difficult to transfer. The painter should have taken care to restrict himself a little when it came to weaving. A detail. The dog who has eaten too much and is just on the brink of sickness. It's totally flowing, but it's in the spirit and the tradition of the Rococo. This first work is the first to capture completely the spirit of that time. The hide-and-seek game, or Le Jeu de Colin Maillard. The second work is still in the spirit of Rococo, it's a work of an astonishing elegance and bearing. It fits perfectly in the tradition of its time. Town and countryside games were the subject of a series of tapestries equally at home in France as in Flanders. Iconographically, technically, Goya moves perfectly in the spirit of the day but something exceptionally phantom-like in the grouping of people distinguishes Goya from all the others working in tapestry. As the works begin to become numerous, one notices a growing quaintness, a lady underneath a parasol, a game of blind man's buff, very nice, but a crockery merchant is already more strange. As the commissions multiplied little by little, and satisfaction of customers permitting it, Goya knew he could dare more strange or bizarre subjects like in the city gate market of Madrid. An equipage is just about to pass by. But the important bit is the crockery merchant in the foreground, with a wonderful sense of composition in general, but mainly an extraordinary attention to detail. One has to see the loving care of the representation of the porcelain, just stunning, poor weavers. And above all, one has to observe even more in this work, which is still from the beginnings, the confrontation Goya draws so much from along his whole career of youth and old age the young woman and the chaperon at her side. They are already there, in the bud, hardly conscious of antinomy, the opposites that will be so typical in Goya's dramatic narrative. It's so beautiful that we get closer to see how stunning the bowl is made, and then, a last detail in the background, a red spot the eye needed, a person from behind with her grand wig a la mode that is only there to carry the red spot. As the series goes on, the subjects become more extraordinary. For example, 
the entrance to the market of Madrid, quite large. This one measures more than two meter, an important piece. There is an enigmatic quaintness in the crowd, but still leaving the leading role to the high-ranked couple. There is also a strangeness in the almost phantom-like solemn apparition of these two people. One then realizes the peculiarity Goya is adventuring himself in, and therefore his clients. These tapestry works are displayed in the different houses of the Spanish court. The iconography of the art of tapestry has been totally regenerated by Goya. The Two Cats Jewel This is the most extraordinary amongst his compositions. It's an above door. I had mentioned above doors in connection with Chardin. It's a completely thankless piece of painting in the format of a doormat, but one that is placed above the door. A real thrown-away piece. But nevertheless, Chardin did create some of his masterpieces as above doors, and so did Goya. This dialogue of the two cats, this duel of the two cats, one grey, the other black, again the antinomy, is absolutely stunning in behaviour and meaning. But still, as with Chardin, its use is limited to an above door. So far, we have looked at what could be called Goya's early works, works, so we are told, that made him laugh in his maturity. Now, we are going to approach his maturity. Jacques Edouard put up an assertion that has to be verified. He said that between 1760 and 1780, there were no great painters working in Spain. It's a long time since the Zurbarans, the Velázquezes, have disappeared, and there is a long time where there is no Goya. We are in an empty period. We will now illustrate a little. We have seen Goya's religious painting. We just have seen, especially Christ on the Cross, the capture of Christ and the Florida. Here is what has been produced during the same years in an ordinary workshop of Madrid. It's nice enough, but quite stupid, this lament of Veronica's veal, scrupulous, industrious, and elementary air of Titian's style, makes you yawn of boredom, and still, he is the best religious painter of those years. In genre painting, Goya produced tapestry carton, and if this was not Goya, it was a painter who knows how to paint, but whose lack of resemblance and sterility makes one cry. But he was very much liked by Marie-Louise Palmer. This painter is one of the great genre painters of that time. For religious painting, or genre painting, one has to face up to the fact that there were no noteworthy representatives for Spain. That means that for Goya to reveal his genius through that little door of tapestry carton, he was absolutely ready to take a place that had been left vacant, the vacancy of an all-Spanish genius. To be objective, and we should be time to time, one domain is remarkably represented by a remarkable painter, Luis Egidio Melendez, a still-life painter, and he is the last of the great Spanish still-life painters. The great period of still-life painting in Spain was in the 17th century, Zurbaran and his pupils extending into the 18th century. Melendez is one of the truly great still-life painters of his time. His still lifes are very dry, very austere, very much monochrome, but of a remarkable poetic quality. In one of the still lives shown here, there is even a tiny little element of Stockkopf. This is the only domain of Madrid's painting we are going to show. What was most highly appreciated in Menendez are the still lives of fruits, lemons, melons, and watermelons, for which he had a distinctive fondness. 
But emerging from the experience he had at the manufacture of Santa Barbara, Goya is ready not only to play a leading role, but a universal one within Madrid painting, because part of him, there was really no other real painter. So, we are now going to get an understanding of other Spanish paintings. For a change, the ruling society of the court of Spain has money, tradition, culture, and is capable of appreciating a genius, a painter on the brink of becoming one of the greatest painters ever. Goya doesn't have to knock on doors. The Spaniards look out for him. One realizes, astonishingly enough, that this short Aragonian, son of a master gilder, producing tapestry cartons, has all the Spanish palace's door opening up to him, certainly everyone in Madrid. He associates with people it usually takes years to win over, the Count of Fiorida Blanca, one of the prominent grandees of Spain, the Count of Altamira, the Marquis of Tolosa. All these peoples receive him as one of their own, as in the enlightened 18th century Spain, a man of genius is considered equal to the nobility and wealthy. Mm. There is a name that has to be mentioned. It's his truest patron, Don Pedro Alcantara, 9th Duke of Osuna. He is the husband of Doña Maria Josefa de la Soledad, Duchess of Osuna. This is one of the greatest families of Spain especially the Duke and the Duchess of Asuna, who belong to the most enlightened people of the 18th century in Europe. The Duke is an exceptional person, the Duchess even more. Her family is madly rich. Madame's French hairdresser lives in their home. Her dresses come from Paris. Her whole library is delivered by express couriers from Paris as well. She reads in three languages, she is an incredible woman, and she will develop a devotion to Goya only possible in Spain. Thinking about the chronicles we have about the poor German painters who lived with the princesses of Hanover and Saxony and could die in their lofts without neither the prince nor the bishop caring, forgetting to pay them, one is totally astonished to learn that in Spain, during the same times, a painter sat at the table with everyone, was consulted about anything and everything. Madame Osuna never put a bouquet on her corsage without asking Goya if it really was all right. It's incredible to see how privileged the artist in the 18th century Spain was compared with almost all the rest of Europe. In any case, it was these Osunas who gave the opportunity to Goya to prosper so highly and permitted him to give up tapestry and concentrate solely on painting. Apart from the Osunas, the infant of Spain, Don Luis de Bourbon, brother of the reigning king Charles III, was the second great palace open to Goya. He was married to Maria Teresa de Valabriga, one of the very great names in Spain. They have children, and amongst them there is a boy, Luis Maria de Bourbon y Valabriga, who will become cardinal. There is also a girl, Maria Teresa de Bourbon y Valabriga. She will become Countess de Chinchon. We will talk about her because Goya witnessed her birth. He also was there when she gave birth and he will be at her side when she will die. It is with great intimacy that he will be part of this family's suffering, being so close to the mother and her daughter. We have seen the very special status of artists in Spain and the very special privilege Goya received as to live and rise immediately high up in power and privileges. It is not a question of fine dining, fine drinking or fine sleeping. It's a question of having the say of commanding. It is these people who, with a lasting fidelity, will guide him through the world, and he will get to know all of them. The Duke and Duchess of Osuna. They are depicted here with their children. 
an early canvas that counts amongst the best portraits of Goya, though still a bit timid. The Marquise of Pontejos. This now is not timid at all anymore. It is an extraordinary piece, one of his great masterpieces, recognized as a central piece of the National Gallery of Washington. This work still has all the qualities of the Rococo period. This somewhat gray monochrome with barely a touch of pink is definitely a Spanish and Goya painting. All the seduction is there. But Goya never stops just there, always keeping the balance of his creation, a stunning canvas. The Duke of Alba, another of Goya's patrons and friends. If there is very little word about him, there is much more about his wife. A Spanish lord who had two passions in his life, to live quietly, which compelled him to live a little bit apart from his wife, and singing. It seems he was one of the greatest singers in his time. Goya shows him holding a score. Apart from the grandees of Spain, Osuna, Alba, Pontejos, and others, Goya, on the same level, also visits the bourgeoisie, important active people, not living a life apart, as this was the case in France. There, Paris and Versailles were two worlds that never met. In Madrid, these worlds associate, and Goya could easily do business with people like Osuna or Alba, and at the same time with rather simple people like Andreas del Peral, doctor of law, who was one of Goya's first clients and collectors. This one is a painting of absolute intensity. With most portraits commissioned by Madrid's aristocracy, Goya was compelled to stick to a mundane composition, even of the clothing, definitely of posture. One can feel that here, that he is much more free. Martinez, the banker, another bourgeois, and one of the most beautiful paintings ever did sign. He was a businessman, great collector of paintings, great lover of the arts, but above all, a great friend and patron of Goya's. His fortune made it possible. Here, in his portrait, you can see severity and grandeur, still relatively early in the beginning of Goya's maturity, but nevertheless one of the privileged, remarkable pages in Goya's whole body of work, and if only for the blue jacket and the stunning way it is depicted. Another portrait is of Juan Antonio Llorento, the third person of legal profession, semi-ecclesiastic, principally historian, then Spain's main archivist, responsible to put in order the Spanish court's archives of the time of Joseph Bonaparte's departure. Goya paints him in a courtly costume. Surrounded by a harmonious area of black and red, Goya painted one of the most intensely intelligent faces and one of the most intense and incisive glances ever painted. Amongst this extremely large clientele that went from Duke of Osuna, top, down to the archivist of a library, there is always the same report of privilege with the model, the same honesty with him or her, and at the same time the quest into the model's inner personality. Goya is not satisfied to look for his models in the high and middle society. He also went to search for them in what in the rest of the country might be called the lower life, the world of theatre, of the corridors. There too he finds his models. Jacques Edouard can't show us, what would be completely wrong, Goya's permissivity. He wants to show us as a whole the 18th century society permissivity. It was possible to be the Duke of Osuna, having Goya as a portraitist and accepting that Goya went to paint also a Torero, particularly a star of the Corrida as Romero. He is 42, at the end of his career, having fought hundreds of bulls. He was, up to a certain point, the idol of Madrid at this time. We know three portraits of Romero. 
The one we are looking at is considered to be the best. It is at Fort Worth, in the Kimball Art Museum, according to Jacques Edouard, the most beautiful art museum in the world. This is a brilliant portrait where Romero's glances carries an astonishing intelligence, speed and conciseness, and something that almost leaves the impression that he is watching a bull's arrival. One witnesses the moment when his glance is lively, fast. It is the glance of a man ready to go out the way to avoid death. One can feel that in the portrait, conveyed in an absolutely masterly way. Romero is not the only one who could be called a third estate model of Goya's. There is also Titania, another creature who gave us the most vibrant painting of an amateur theatre actress, as one called it in those days. In France, she could have been excommunicated. In Spain, she was applauded and celebrated. This is one of Goya's most intense portraits. Today, it is the admired property of the very posh Academy of San Fernando of Madrid. A painting so beautiful in its details, the representation of silks, where Goya has become a grand master craftsman in adorning the portraits. One can recognize to what degree of splendor and what virtuosity Goya's touch has become lighter when he does achieve such transparencies, as the famous softness we talked about when we looked at the machas on the balcony. In order to hand this immense series of portraits that go from the infant to the actress, I want to show you now a masterpiece that is not well known from Goya. It's a canvas that has only been recently found. Louis of Bourbon and his family. It's an intimate painting offered by Goya to those who offered him board and lodging. There they are, in their evening finery, where one played bezique, the fashionable game, where the lady's hair is done for the theatre, where the husband wonders how he can escape from a performance, and where the children, the chaperons, and the rest were in a good noisy mood. Goya is there, painting, in a way as if he wanted to imitate jokingly the arrangement of the Menins of Velasquez. This would then be the Menins at the office. We will now have a look at details concerning color differences before and after their restoration. This painting has been restored after it recently had been put back on the market in 1974. After restoration, the colors appear much clearer and the brushwork much more incisive. On the right, around the table between Don Luis and Marie Teresa de Villabriga, his wife, one can see the members of the house. It is astonishing to see how, in this composition, the faces are excessively enlarged. In order to become aware of Goya's approach, here are some of the faces. An aged face, lacklustre gaze, but nevertheless, there is the spark of an extraordinary intelligence. This is Don Luis de Bourbon, Spanish infant. Facing him, his wife, the brilliant Madame de Villabriga y Bourbon, one of the most beautiful and brilliant women of her time. Surrounding the couple, people with more weight, more than Don Luis has, even more than his wife, who is in the center of the painting, like a kind of utility. There are those house servants showing really amazing strength and presence. There is as well the private secretary of Don Luis and the extraordinary butler, almost like one of the black paintings of Goya's late period, that appears in the half shadow on the left-hand side of the painting. In the midst of all this, the portraits of the children, for whom Goya, a bit like Velázquez, always had quite an astonishing predilection. The elder son, Don Luis de Bourbon Villabriga, who will become cardinal a bit later, one of these all blonde, all anemic, all Bourbon, fairly transparent, but at the moment still Mazarsian. 
beside him one of the loveliest child portraits of the 18th century. Even Chardin didn't manage to depict this fruity tenderness, this smile. It's Maria Theresa who one day will become the Countess de Chinchon, a most dramatic destiny in Spanish history. The smiling little girl has no idea that one day she will inherit this painting, as it's in her hands that this superb composition will end up. This painting is still very little known. It reappeared quite recently in 1974 after a very long period of oblivion. This marvelous canvas belonged to Don Luis de Bourbon and became, at his death, part of the estate of Maria Theresa, the very one who would become Countess de Chichon. Then she passed it on to her daughter, Carlotta Luisa de Bourbon, Igodoy et Valbriga. She again will marry the Prince Camille Vespoli in 1820. The painting leaves Madrid for Florence, where the Vespoli have their home, and will not leave the Vespoli Palace until 1974. Unknown to everybody, even the greatest specialist on Goya, this painting was completely forgotten. In 1974, the Vespoli family had some re-roofing to do. They put it on the art market. There never was a bomb more extraordinary in the art world. A Goya already would be rare, but a Goya of this size and quality, completely crazy. The result of the bidding frenzy was probably good enough to cover the Vespoli roofs. The canvas is 2 meters 48 high and 3 meters 30 wide. It is absolutely original and, since the fusillade of the 2nd of May, one had not seen a Goya of this size to be put up for auction in this century. Meanwhile, Goya, on intimate terms with the Asuna, the Alba, and everybody there, had left only one step to clear to get into the service of the king, and in 1786 he became the painter of King Charles III. The King's Painter he gets an honorable pension of 15,000 rials right away. That's a tiny bit less than Francisco Bayeux, who had an easier hand. For these 15,000 rials, without extras, he worked for Charles III, Charles IV, and Ferdinand VII. To the end of his life, he will be painter of the chamber Pintor da Camera. When Goya enters the service of the old king Charles III, he was already a quite worn-out king. As most of the Bourbons of that time, he was ill, genetically ill, and was also a bit tired of power. He developed great intellectual elegance that changed itself into a slightly tiring and cynical scepticism. Nevertheless, Goya started to work for him. Later, there would be the son, Charles IV, one of the most useless sovereigns in Spanish history, married to a fearsome wife, Mary Louise of Parma. Together, the Great Owl and the Little Owl, as they were nicknamed, they created their heir, Prince of Asturias, Ferdinand VII, who, without any doubt, will be the ugliest king in Europe. Let's see how Goya served these people. There are a series of absolutely extraordinary paintings I'm going to show you. To paint an Osuna is already something, but to paint the King of Spain is something different altogether. Obviously, there are contingencies to take notice of, a format, technique, deadlines, countless copies to be made, and all have to be the same quality and have to be originals. It is no sinecure. Charles IV on his draught horse, a figure who resembles a bit of Louis XVI of France without his intuition and bonhomie. Now, Mary Louise of Parma. One could hardly have invented a more extraordinary, more dantesque creature to put on a throne. She too on the back of a solid horse. These two paintings are more than three meters high. They were painted to work as companion pieces to decorate the embassies of Spain. 
we won't be seeing more portraits of the king that are less interesting. Think that it's quite different for the queen. It is extraordinary to witness the journey through time with the pictures of Marie-Louise of Parma. Being the Princess of Parma, she was very lucky to marry the old Spanish king, to become Queen of Spain and, above all, to rule as she has done. With her unmeasurable rudeness and lack of culture, as everybody said of her already at her time, she was totally passionate. But on the other hand, she was very quick-minded. She chose her lovers in the royal garrison, sampled nearly every soldier to finally elect the greatest stallion amongst them. This man, Manuel Godoy, who will lose the whole Spanish dynasty, was a man she is not only happy to have as a lover, she wants as well to ennoble him by multiplying his titles, which will, in the end, allow Napoleon I to intrude into Spanish affairs. Mary Louise of Parma. Frankly, she is ugly, but she never wanted to accept this fact. Nothing is good enough. After she has seen the hairdo of the Duchess of Asuna, she too had a hairdresser come from Paris who put on her head the most delicate lace, flowers and feathers. Also, her dresses came from Paris. Throughout her reign, Mary Louise will develop this predatory side. Age didn't make things better. This extremely pronounced predatory side, this owl side, a phrase created by the Duchess of Alba. As she finally understands that this French dressing way is highly unpopular, she dresses the Spanish way. And there is this great official portrait where you can see her in a grand costume, Madrid style, that is completely mind-blowing. One little detail. A strain monomania has not to be blamed on Goya, but on Mary Louise. Everywhere she went, she had to show her large and milky arms. The only thing about herself that the Queen was crazy about and very proud. That's why those arms had to appear on every picture. If not, the painting would be condemned. One has to look at the arms, because it is funny to see how Goya shows this obsession of his royal patroness by turning her arms into terrifying arms, too long, too fat, too milky. Age doesn't help to make things better. Her portrait, in the early 1800s, shows her in her finery and with a smile that covers up the almost total lack of teeth. At that time, Godoy keeps calling her in public my Semiramis. This is the family our Goya is going to paint. In a short parenthesis, we're going to see quickly the places where this family liked to live. It is true that one can, and to a certain point, must poke fun at the king and queen's strange couple, because never has the adulterer been as much officialized, and never a royal court has been shown and qualified so vividly as being so stupid and appalling. Rereading the notes of the Bayonne interview with Napoleon's emissaries, it is dantesque to see how the Spanish family, and in any case, Charles IV and Marie-Louise, are dragged through the mud in the face of the whole world. One also has to appreciate the refinement there was. The residencies of Charles and Marie-Louise belong to the most beautiful, the most exquisite establishments of the whole Europe. These people maybe didn't behave admirably in their daily and nightly life, but at least they had very good taste. Rather than revisiting the Royal Palace of Madrid, which had been seen at the times of Tiepolo, we are going to the countryside in one of the favorite residencies of Charles IV, Aranjuez Castle. 
The Arendtres Castle is very severe, but brightened up by admirable waterworks in the front the Queen had just built. It just should burble, giving the impression of a cascade when one stepped out from the bedroom. The palace itself is what all the royal palaces are at the time. That means quite dull, a lot of red and loads of gold, but the furniture, perfect Rococo style, furniture of a remarkable design quality and draughtsmanship. One has the same furniture at the court of Parma and of the two Sicilies. One has such furniture, to a certain point, also on the English court. Not much better, but also not much lesser. One item is a true masterpiece, the cabinet of porcelains. We have seen the small cabinet of porcelains at the Royal Palace of Madrid. The one here is its further development and its apotheosis. It is done by the same artisan master, Giuseppe Gricci, but this one is done in Chinese style, which is exceptional. Panels of painted porcelains alternate with large mirrors, creating an illusion. This decor is the most elegant and accomplished of the century. If it were only for the layout of a piece like this, one didn't have to despair totally about this couple. Their understanding of patronage and their sense of quality makes up for a lot. An adorable framework displaying scenes à la chinoise in which the king loved to recognize himself, or along the true more mirrors, other Chinese scenes where in turn the queen particularly loved to recognize herself. In any case, high quality of work, inspiration, and beauty absolutely stunning. The Chinese Salon of Aranjuez was a place of conversation for Charles and Marie-Louise. When the public life became too much for them, they retired to the bottom of the garden, where they had created La Casa del Labrador. La Casa del Labrador the house of the laborer, is similar to all the European courts. It allowed the royal couple to live the simplicity of the hamlet, as Marie Antoinette had put into fashion at Versailles, and it can be found in all follies and parks and gardens of Europe. The folly of Aranjuez is the house of the laborer, that Charles and Marie-Louise are going to give to the Prince of Asturias, the future Ferdinand VII. We are in the years of plain neoclassicism, 1780, the year the piece has been created. One reads only but Winkelmann, applauds only but Mengs, and anything that doesn't have a Greek-Roman signature is worthless. The set consists of marble and bricks, of which Winkelmann said to be the perfection of the antique taste, with an infinite row of statues and bas-relief to illuminate the Pompeianism so much in fashion then. The entire decor is a real symphony of neoclassicism, a style Jacques Edouard likes very much, but was never seen anywhere with such accomplishment as in the Casa del Labrador of Aranjuez. This is up to date with the most beautiful examples of neoclassicism in the world. There is extraordinary tapestry that is not painted paper, but embroidery enriched with gold and silver thread, showing delightful Pompeian themes, as well as furniture with a grandfather clock amongst it that is absolutely bursting with Pompeianism. When the clock is moved, so we can see the whole quality of the surrounded fabric, one is completely stunned. The state of preservation, the quality of inspiration, make it definitely a masterpiece we should stay with, if only for the detail of the vase of flowers. There is no more beautiful example of neoclassicism in decorative arts than this. All of this little palace is similarly decorated with an exquisite fantasy. Along the walls, this silk broidery, in the upper part and the ceiling, grand frescoes in trompe l'oeil, depicting the great Roman sacrifices or the great moments of Roman and Greek life. All this with an astounding fantasy in painterly terms. It was Mary Louise who commissioned it all. 
And if we turn up our noses, there is always a beautiful Apollo who is present in a mind-boggling number. And as if that was not enough, there is the most ludicrous but lovely thing of the casa, the tiny staircase painted as trompe l'oeil with loads of fake niche populated with fake young people having their eyes on the real queen. This is psychologically clever, creating for herself a trompe l'oeil crowd watching her passing by, an utterly unusual idea. These few documents intend to illustrate the environment Charles IV, Mary Louise and their children have lived in. This is in no respect the mediocre environment one might have thought far from it. It was one of the most prestigious, most cultivated and the most elegant environments of Europe. It was for those people that Goya is going to sign his famous painting, The Family of Charles IV. There they all are, the ones who will make and break Spain. One recognizes the king, the queen, surrounded by the whole family, infants and infantas, headed by Don Luis. This painting asked a lot of Goya. Nobody wanted to pose, nobody kept to the posing dates. It was an endless battle to try to bring together these people who wouldn't want to meet each other at any cost. The result was a series of portraits, studies, stolen from privileged moments when Goya could have a go, so in less than half an hour he painted the portraits which later on served to put together the great composition. There were Louis Ferdinand, infant of the Royal House of Spain, Luis Carlos, the youngest and the last of the infants, one of the loveliest portraits of an infant Goya ever painted. Dona Maria Josefa. Between these terrible figures in the background, this wonderful Dona Maria Teresa, also a Spanish infanta, elder sister to Don Luis. She also had the privilege before him. She was first to him in the succession to the throne. Here she is in the last years of her life, and still she shows this strangeness in her look. This surely is in the history of official portraits one of the most remarkable. One always wonders how the Bourbon family could accept this work, how they had the courage of hanging it amongst all the splendor as it was put up in the royal palace. It was so a brilliant observation but at the same time, a terrible accusation of society. This was the royal family, but there is more royalty to be had, the famous Godoy. At last, he had become Prince of Peace, this was his title, after having been Lieutenant General, Generalissimo, Prime Minister, having accumulated a number of improbable titles as Marquis, Count and Duke. For this man, nothing was good enough. As Goya had to paint him too, we are going to look at this portrait. One must know that Goya hated him as much as every good Spaniard could. In order to see what it was that could have attracted the Queen, voila an anonymous and mediocre portrait. Godoy, at the beginning of his career, was 22. This is the moment he began to cruise amongst the majesties. Godoy by Goya at the height of his glory. He is Prince of Peace and beginning to guide Spain into the diplomatic and political ruin of his making. One can see how he has changed over the years. From a face that one could have tried to define as intelligent now holds itself in a way one could define as arrogant and aristocratic. Here he has just received his warrants and, reading them in a decor completely dictated, where Goya had no other liberty but to stigmatize, the way he more or less had always done, the inside of the personality, the soul of the person. 
So, he succeeded up to a certain point to show a measure of intelligence Godoy certainly wasn't lacking, a great ability, a formidable power of dissimulation, a cosmic cowardice and everything that makes up the niceties Godoy was to be afflicting the royal family with until he will separate from the queen, a last cowardice of a man who won't even have the courage to live to the end of the catastrophe he is responsible for. Beside that puffy and reddish face, Goya allows himself the luxury of highlighting Godoy's aide-de-camp, giving him an intelligent and extraordinary glowing face. Godoy, who never shied away from bad taste, offered this portrait to the Royal Academy of San Fernando of Madrid. Godoy was the Queen's lover. Everybody knew it. But there was some chatter going on in foreign courts. Godoy failed to marry. The Queen looked for the least dangerous but highest ranked bride, and her choice fell on the little Maria Teresa of Bourbon y Valabriga. We have seen when she was still very young. In the meantime, she had become Countess of Chinchon. She still was a girl, and this was a magnificent match. For the Queen, this was a way to humiliate Don Luis, whom she had a panic fear of, who also offered his own daughter to the royal lover. This was, above all, a way to find a rival not too encumbering. Mademoiselle of Chinchon was of a calm nature, sweet and withdrawn. Nevertheless, there will be a dreadful drama as Madame of Chinchon fell madly in love with her dummy of a husband. She will nourish an indestructible passion for him, which will render her the most wretched woman at the court of Madrid. Goya, who followed her from birth to her death, has left us this extraordinary portrait of hers. She stands out against a black background. She has a cruelty, a sense of cruelty. One really gets the impression that in that black, all the rumors, all the mockeries, all the insults, and all the hoots of a court are plagued on Madame of Chinchon. They are there, they are present. Paying attention to her tiny, thin arms, her little fingers. She carries an immense ring, hardly fit to hold the medallion representing Godoy, whom she hardly ever met. He made her pregnant at their second wedding night and never shared a bed with her after. This is the strange destiny of all of Goya's characters. Now, there is only one left we have to talk about, who deeply touched Goya. She, who lived very much on the fringe of the court. She never is there because she gets deeply bored. She is the most beautiful, the most intelligent, the most spiritual, the most marginal Spain has ever known, the Duchess of Alba. Everything has been said, has been written about Goya and the Duchess of Alba. It's easy game for biographers. But it is not to define the truth that would ever come out. The one thing that can be reported is that, in fact, without any doubt, Goya and the Duchess of Alba had been very close for a short time. They were lovers. This is a certitude. And also, they separated very quickly to just remain friends. We have seen the Duke of Alba, he who loved Singh so much, he died at the age of 41, and the Duchess, as it was the convention, had to retire into her estates of San Luca to go into mourning. The next day, but one of her arrival at San Luca, she is reunited with Goya, who pays her a visit of condolences that would last for 17 months. Some letters, some drawings, allowed the persistence of an unlikely scandalous chronicle. The only thing we know for sure is the extraordinary and quick match of two twin souls, both of them passionate, both extreme, both breakers of each other. But in fact, this passion won't last very long, 
and will soon make room for a very affectionate intimacy, a truly great friendship that could have lasted for a very long time. It is not told often enough that this friendship wasn't broken neither by the Duchess nor by Goya, but by death, as the Duchess of Alba died very young at the age of 42, after having known Goya for a very short time. Here is a swift sketch done at San Luca showing the Duchess getting permission to go out from her governess. The story goes that the Duchess jumped at the governess who brandishes her crucifix, telling her that she is not properly covered. This is a humorous picture, a funny piece, but at the same time of quite an extraordinary sensibility. As she spent her time in prayer, the Duchess called the chaperon, nurse and governess, La Beata, the pious one. Now, this is the most intimate picture of the liaison of Goya and the Duchess of Alba. No doubt that in this picture, which is not a very good one, there is a certain quite strong bowing on Goya's side. He wants to be up-to-date, neoclassical, something that didn't suit him well. But in the picture that depicts Cupid and Psyche, Psyche, no doubt, is the Duchess of Alba, and Cupid is what Goya always wanted to be, but naturally never was. This is probably the most flashing love token we know of their liaison. It is now firmly established that none of the two Mahas portray the Duchess of Alba. This didn't fit into the customs of the time. This didn't correspond to the Duchess's habits. This would also have given offence to Goya's taste, as, even if he had painted the Duchess like this, he never would have sold the picture. It is important to keep in mind, and that's hardly dry stuff, that these two paintings had been sold to Godoy, the sworn enemy. Would anybody in the world sell his beloved woman to the sworn enemy? Of course not. These two pictures of Macha dressed and Macha in the nude date from the time of an awakening sensuality that coincided with the one Goya held for the Duchess. However, these are the most supreme paintings Goya ever has executed in his own unique solar system. Macha dressed, Macha in the nude. Godoy got the offer of these two paintings so one could be covered by the other. By a mechanism operated by a piece of string, the dressed Macha could be lifted to reveal the one in the nude. Looking at this staggering piece of painting, one has to say that never a skin had been painted so pearly than that of this Macha in the nude, never a nude so inspired since the Venus of Velázquez, strange by the way that this should happen in the least permissive in that respect country, Spain. Quite strange to think that the two most extraordinarily central Venuses the Venus with the mirror of Velázquez at the National Gallery of London and Goya's nude in the Madrid Prado. Quite strange to think that Velázquez and Goya have signed the two maybe ultimate female nudes imaginable. At the time, Godoy will see his fortune falling and will lose his rank and power in a deplorable end, these two paintings were picked up by the Inquisition, causing Goya any trouble. They just were one more piece in the dossier of his exile, for never in Spain one had dared to create something as pornographic as that. In 1936, Spain issued two stamps of Maja dressed and Maja in the nude. To the amazement of the Ministry of Post and Communication, all the letters stamped with the nude Macha were returned to him from the USA who managed to forbid a stamp with a naked woman on it. This was the last stigma of one of Goya's works. Now, as we know all the people who were Goya's near relations and friends, 
It's probably time to know Goya through some autoportraits Jacques Edouard has drawn up. Autoportrait. The most stupefying painted for the Academy of San Fernando is also a bit of a joke. If one paints oneself for the Academy, one paints oneself in a recognizable fashion. To paint oneself with the light from behind and being totally unrecognizable at a time of his full glory was a reminder for those years he had been refused and ignored. A fine game he plays here. At the time of his love affair with the Duchess of Alba, he is not a boy anymore. He is a man of 47 to 49 years, rather strapping, in rather good health, who has the best eye in the world. This is the first Otto portrait we've got from him. It will be followed by a second, just on the eve of the horrible events of the beginning of the 19th century, the war with France. Otto portrait. This is Goya in his years of deafness and bad health. One sees how the eye tries to understand. It's so convincing in this picture. The clothing is treated with imperial splendor. We are now at the end of his life. He is almost 70 at the time he paints this auto portrait. There is a kind of shading off due to the pain, to sorrow, to the isolation of deafness and other illnesses graft on top but he accommodates the passion of a lion in this staggering picture. In the last one we are going to see, he finds himself close to death. He is almost 80, an auto-portrait in which he pays an homage to his doctor, Dr. Arieta, who is there trying to save him from a malaise that every time nearly took him away. With terrific expressionism, Goya shows himself saved for once again by his good Dr. Arietta, to whom he gave this painting that is now at the Art Institute of Minneapolis. It is there one of the most dramatic works of art. Goya's Last Palette. Goya's Last Palette was found in his studio in Bordeaux. Framed with a wreath of golden laurels, it is now a feather in the cap of the Royal Academy, the same Royal Academy that had refused him for so many years. Now we enter the last chapter, the one that could be named the last years. Goya, witness of his time. Our Goya has now been deaf for a long time. There are these inexplicable illnesses undermining his health. Headaches, stinging pain in the head and chest, all kinds of very vague diagnoses have been put up by the doctors. There was talk about hereditary syphilis, syphilis not completely cured, poisoning by lead white, which was widely used by painters in the 18th century, who often licked their brushes. Also, Goya's mania, poisoning themselves and easily dying from it. There was also talk of poisoning by yellow of Cadiz. In short, there was talk about all kinds of things. Jacques Edouard can't add a new solution, but simply tells us that in these years, Goya is a man totally withdrawn by a total loss of hearing, a man fighting to continue painting, similar to Beethoven, fighting to continue composing, and who both produced the greatest masterpieces in the years of deafness. What's extraordinary, while he still could hear, Goya talked with other people, his models, the portrait. From the time he was isolated by his deafness, he went out to find others in order to listen to them by his eyes. One begins to see that, in the years of deafness, he paints the most beautiful pictures of crowds, of streets, where one really thinks to hear music. It's like an exorcism of the disability that deafness is, even for a painter. That's where one has to look for the strength of Goya. To paint a village feast like the burial of the sardine, while hearing nothing, is quite a thing. To portray just by colours and lines the noise, the commotion, the music and the feast, 
What an extraordinary achievement! To put it like this, Goya's most powerful works, the most moving, the most beautiful ones, had been painted at the time when the eye had become the complement of all the other senses, certainly the sense of hearing. The two machas with a letter. This is a formidable masterpiece. It's at the Museum of Lille and dates from the same time as our machas at the balcony. Some historians think that the machas with the letter of Lille and the machas at the balcony could have been painted as pendants of a musical accord of everyday joy Goya would be painting more of. But these paintings of joy will become very, very rare, not just become Goya became bitter. He became bitter as everybody does, but because this is not just Goya's bitterness, it is Spain's bitterness that got hold of him. We are in the years 1807-1808. The French are at the doors, only waiting for an opportunity to enter, led by Murat, under the pretext of disposing of the degenerated Bourbon kings. That's what they did, putting up a new king, Joseph Bonaparte. But Madrid revolts, not wanting his sovereigns to be replaced. This is the start of the repression, these horrible nights of May the 2nd and the 3rd, 1808, and the beginning of the war Goya had become mixed in like everybody. In these years, the tone isn't set any more on the machas, be it the ones at the balcony or the ones reading letters. The tone is set on things much more grave, more terrible, as in the scene of a great fire. In the scene of a great fire, or even more so in The Hanged Monk, that is a fabulous sketch, here we see the power of the great prince Goya will create, a frightening thing that is at the Art Institute of Chicago. A small Goya, but of an extraordinary dramatic force. Even more so in The Blacksmiths. Amongst these reports, which become worse and worse, these very big pictures depicting the blacksmiths, where Goya shows all the power and at the same time the blindness of Spanish crowd, ready to do anything in order to destroy the French, the forge being nothing else but the massacre of French soldiers that took place in the fields. Or this one, the knife grinder, that is also an accusation of the crowd's inertness, blindness and stupefaction. By the slant of his symbols, blacksmith or knife grinder, Goya shows his growing awareness of the horror his country goes through. Until 1814, Goya proposes, as an historical account, to illustrate the great moments of the resistance of Madrid, telling the horrors of 1808. The invasion of Spain in 1808, the reaction of Madrid in May 2nd and 3rd, 1808, these pictures have been painted in 1814. The French had just been chased out of Spain. Thanks to Wellington, the Battle of Vitoria, there were no French left in Spain. There was a Regency government awaiting the return of Ferdinand VII. This Regency government gets Goya's proposition of immortalizing the Spanish bravery. The proposal was accepted, and so we receive the two most intense paintings Goya has ever done. May 2nd, 1808, the massacre of Spaniards in the streets of Madrid at the Puerta del Sol by the Mamelukes employed by the French. May the 3rd, 1808, this is the infamous slaughter by firing squad on the surrounding hills of Madrid. These are two mesmerizing paintings where we have the French soldiers treated like shadows forming a relentless war machine opposite a nakedness of white and yellow of those to be executed. 
a painting that from 1814 to today will remain one of the most violent and passionate statements of the human horror that can develop in times of war. Manet also had a total passion for this picture, which, by the way, he quoted in his execution of Maximilian. A detail. The one who is going to die in a moment, and all the others behind him, who are brought up from behind, the old, the young, men, women, monks, who are to be shot. And in the middle of the canvas, quite often overlooked, this dark lantern throwing a diabolical light into the whole composition. As Goya in 1814 painted the events of the 2nd and 3rd of May 1808, he did it as a patriotic work, so history might remember. But this was to be received very badly. While the Regency Council happily accepted Goya's spontaneous testimony, Ferdinand VII, remounting the throne, dismissed the Regency Council and took up power again. He had forgotten nothing. Ferdinand VII certainly is the most sorrow, shabby and dull figure, and his spirit of revenge is absolute. Everybody who could have worked for the French one way or the other had to disappear. Ferdinand VII mounted the throne to happily execute his personal vendettas. And that's it. Who, during the years Joseph Bonaparte had been King of Spain, couldn't or hadn't had to work for him? Who was not forced to take care to keep his job at the court? Goya was court painter, and this was to Charles III, Charles IV, Ferdinand VII, or Joseph Bonaparte. Remains a picture, a Madrid allegory. In a Madrid allegory, one can see in a corner a symbol representing Joseph Bonaparte. That was all Ferdinand VII needed to expel Goya from Madrid. So this will be the two last dark phases of Goya's life. He, who is already an old man, at least through his state of health, will be expelled from Madrid and is forced to buy a house outside Madrid, La Quinta del Sordo. There, he will do his painterly will, but then, as if this wasn't enough, and also because he is hunted down, he has to leave Spain behind. And under the pretext of having treatment at the spy of Plombières, he flees to Bordeaux, where he will die in 1828 in a complete disgrace of a Spain led by the ill temper of his king. Goya dies in exile just because he incautionally left a symbol of Joseph Bonaparte in a corner of one of his paintings. The last part of what we are going to see is the time when the artist is already very old, a man more than 70, of whom the king is in pursuit. A man at the end of a career on which a stupid king hits his blows. Goya had to leave Madrid, his post, his functions. He had to retire into oblivion at the Quinta del Sordo. There he has time to reflect, and with his last paintings, he will give us a speeded up version of what his life and what is the human species. Just before he left for La Quinta, here is the last painting he did in Madrid, The Colossus of the Panic. It is a picture that is at the source of all fantasies. The real subject is not the French arriving in Spain, as often said. On the contrary, it is the genie who guards and protects Spain who wakes up to chase the French. This we know through a contemporary rhyming chronicle. Goya painted the awakening of Spain's guardian angel, a highly nationalist canvas, the house of the deaf. This man, who had done everything to be remembered by history, not so much as a painter, but as a chronicler of great events by painting May the 3rd or May the 4th, painting the Colossus, 
This man found himself one day in a house that already is called Quinta del Sordo because the previous owner had been deaf. A small house with a salon on the ground floor and a salon on the first floor. The years Goya is going to spend there in almost total solitude, he devotes to painting in oil on a coat of plaster. Fourteen compositions no other painter at the time would have dared to paint. These are the black paintings that mark the last part of Goya's career. We are going to see them all. The Sabbath. Symbolizing the obscurantism of the masses face by face, where the great billy goat, Satan, is the orator who magnetizes the crowd, the star performer who transforms the mad ones into animals, as it was so much the case during the war 1808-1814. Or the procession of St. Isidore, another frightening statement of facial expressions made looking stupid by a faith blind and degenerate. This is also the frightening leitmotiv of the power of the Church and the role it has played during those years. Or, still, the pilgrimage to the Fountain of St. Isidore. This is the famous procession, the Holy Office, in other words, the Inquisition, organized every year to the miracle Fountain of St. Isidore in order to reinvigorate its intellectual honesty. Here we see the members of the Inquisition. The person that often was said to be an old woman is in fact the Grand Inquisitor. This renders the canvas even more frightening. Because this machine still existed, the Inquisition was still working. Goya just had a close shave by them because of his mahas. To paint the members of the Inquisition in black onto the wall of his house is something quite extraordinary. The procession ends at infinity, ends in a background almost as in a Chinese painting, showing very well the blind obscurantism that leads the most narrow-minded ideas. Then, on the first floor, after having stated the horror of man's nature, Goya goes even further and shows us in a series of opposites, opposites he calls complementary, absolutely stunning visions. A first picture. Saturn divorced his children, a picture hard to stomach, of which Malraux has talked about so well. This canvas is one of the blackest and cruelest ever known in the history of art. It is combined with one of the sweetest of his works. Macha Musing. The two canvases, Saturn and Macha, had been created as counterparts, complementing each other. The expressionism, the noise, the cruelty, the blindness of Saturn and this musing young woman. She is called La Macha or La Leocadia, for it is, according to some biographers, the portrait of Goya's last companion, Leocadia Weiss. The person is beautiful, the work of a quality in the simplicity of the extraordinary green. All the more when one thinks that the Saturn was next to her, and that furor and peace, passion and serenity share the composition. To the first couple, Saturn, Leocadia, corresponds a second couple. The parties, certainly a unique vision of the three parties who weave, spin and cut the thread of life, the inevitable death awaiting every one of us, passing over the mass of humans like a silent cloud, is a grandiose vision and is the counterpart of the dualist or the bull shepherds. Again, we encounter the same fatality through the foundness of opposites, but on a strictly terrestrial level. This picture shows us, obviously, two peasants beating each other with clubs without realizing that both are going to die 
as they are sucked down into quicksand. This, too, is a vision of the inevitable, as, on a mythological level, the three parties had been the portrayal of the inevitable. Mythological level, human level, again, we have two canvases completing each other admirably, and both in stupendous clair obscure. Then, amongst these couples, there are rather oblong paintings that show us a fantastic gallery of mankind, absolutely terrifying, as one easily can imagine. The reader or the politicians, a fabulous piece, a daumier without a shadow of daumier's lightness. It's a heavy daumier, inexorable, but at the same time of a crazy power. Or, two laughing women. The woman to the right is unbearable with her appalling laughter that is rather the laughter of a toad. Or, two old women. The one on the right is reduced to the state of a living skeleton. Another unbearable picture. Or the two monks, one of the most terrible paintings of that series, certainly the monk on the right, who isn't left with the strength to sing an Ave Maria in a state that death soon will claim his life. Another bewildering work. And this long cycle, one of the most beautiful ever painted in art history, ends with one of the most stunning pictures an Occidental painter has ever done, a picture of nothing. A dog getting sucked into quicksand. Nine-tenths of the composition consists of nothing but a leaden sky, and looking further down, one ends up discovering the sandbank. The dog is about to be sucked in. Death in suspense, death in waiting, but in any case, an inexorable death. It's extremely upsetting to think that painting in the ground floor these grand processions, these uselessness of human pride shown off by the members of the Inquisition, painting in the second floor these antinomies that show us what life is about, what decay of life we have to expect. The cycle ends with the image of a dog who not even has got enough oxygen to howl off his anguish. It's impossible to express any better the confusion Goya must have been in during these years than by the dog on this canvas. After having painted this series, nothing holds him in his quinta, and he flees towards Bordeaux, where he spends the last few years of his life in peace. We don't want to leave Goya with the dog, so let's look at the last, or almost last, of the pictures he assigned, going back to life. The Milkmaid of Bordeaux, a sublime piece, all of a sudden, everything brightens up. The colors, the lightness of his touch. Transparency are back, toned with gravity. But nevertheless, his work again has got this creative inspiration, which is so admirable. Just one thing was left for him to do now, that is to die, which he did at 82. Jacques Edouard thinks we did talk tonight about one of the most prodigious titans of Occidental culture.